This tank chat's going to be about this vehicle, the Centaur, uh, known also as the Mark 8 cruiser tank or the A27L. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members, and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. Complex story behind it, so bear with me. We're going to have to start way back in the early 1920s when Britain put into service the Vickers Medium Tank, 1923. And the Vickers Medium is really the tank that Britain uses right the way up to the end of the 1930s. Um, they experiment replacing it. There was going to be a vehicle called the 14 tonner, a bit too expensive. They ended up trying some weird and wacky experiments, independent, for example, with five turrets. These other projects don't really lead anywhere. Um, the only ones that do is at the early 1930s, they start a program for light tanks with Vickers and a series of light tanks are built up leading to the Mark 6B at the end of the 1930s. 1935, with the realization war looks like it's coming, um, Britain decides it's going to actually have to formalize what type of tanks it needs and how they're going to be used. So we see in 35, the idea comes out that we're gonna have that cruiser tank will overtake or take the role of the medium tank that Vickers had built in 1923. And the idea of the cruiser tank, you're gonna have these three types, the light tank scouting, etc. Cruiser tanks are there for exploitation. These advocates for the armoured force, this is the type of tank they wanted, this idea of fast exploitation, and they're going to give cruiser tanks an anti-tank gun because the belief then is that we will end up bumping into the enemy's anti-tank force, which is likely to be tanks, so they've got to be able to knock them out. So a two-pounder gun will go on the cruiser tank. And that third category that's really in many ways goes back to the old school of thought, Hugh Ellis as Master of Ordnance in 1935. He's back in the First World War, he was head of the tanks. He's looking at the tank as a support for the infantry on the attack. So that third category, infantry tanks, um, they end up giving them machine guns and then anti-tank guns as well, but thicker armor, slow to attack prepared positions. So 1936, uh, one of the senior figures in the war office, Martel, heads out to Moscow with a, a, a group of officers that see the Soviets' experiments and their war maneuvers. And from that point, having seen Christie suspension being used on their BT tanks, um, and knowing that Britain is now going to be building a program of cruiser tanks, when he gets back to the UK, he makes a really big suggestion to the War Office, look, this is a way to go if you want a fast tank for exploitation. Let's import, and they actually do import, two hulls from Water, Water Christie in America, this slightly maverick experimental person. These two hulls are brought across the Atlantic. Um, they're actually under the cover, they're called tractors. Um, because officially at this time, the US government would not allow war material to be sold on that way otherwise. Um, and we look at those and the Christie suspension, this idea of having a double skin side to the vehicle in that double skin is a system which has got basically one long arm, another arm that will support that long arm. And it gives great play to the suspension arm. And that means the vehicle can go faster over rough ground. And the other thing that comes with that is the Christie vehicles are powered by the American Liberty engine that was developed in the First World War. It has a lot more power. In fact, it's got about two and a half times um, the power to weight ratio of any British tank at the time, um, which makes that vehicle very fast. Quickly, the British decide we don't like that other Christie feature, which is it can run on its wheels if you take the tracks off. That's abandoned. But we start this program of cruiser tanks and after the first couple we then start using Christie suspension in that um, in this new type of model vehicle. 1939 obviously there's a desire to increase production 1940 some of those cruisers are out in France and they're lost and this is where we then get into this period where, as I've said on a number of the other tank chats, you've got to remember what that world situation is, and certainly the situation for Britain in 1940. 
the emphasis goes straight towards the Air Force for defending the island and the Navy because we're a colonial power and we've got the channel. We don't want the Germans to be able to cross the channel. Tanks drop into the secondary category of importance. In fact, this is basing on a policy for Britain's strategic defence that dates way back to the earlier 1930s. Chamberlain actually puts this in place and Churchill follows that. And when you think about it, it's a pretty sensible policy um, because it works for Britain in that way. What it doesn't seem to work for is, of course, the tank crews and tank design, because then we start falling behind in our development process. Now, in that summer of 1940, an order is put into uh, the war office, say, look, we are going to want a heavier cruiser tank. Um, out in France, we've already had the situation where um, we've seen that, again, the Panzer IVs have got a short barrel 7.5 centimetre gun. Um, there is a belief that bigger guns are coming. Um, so the idea, the emphasis comes back, two pounders, good at the moment, best anti-tank gun in Europe, but you're going to need a bigger one. Now, Britain has always developed or has already developed the six pounder, about a 57 millimetre high velocity gun. We haven't put it into production yet. But an order goes out from the war office, we are going to need a heavier cruiser tank. They call it heavy cruiser. It's going to need a bigger turret ring to take a bigger gun. 60 inch turret ring is what they asked for. The expectation is it's going to be the six pounder, although that's not actually mentioned in the first requirement. It's going to have to have at least 75 millimeters of frontal armor. So that's much heavier than the cruiser tanks that had gone before. And all round, they want better reliability and mobility of that vehicle as a cruiser. And the specification goes out that this vehicle, it needs to be ready by the spring of 1942. So again, a relatively short development time. If you look at some of the previous um, development times we've had for, for armoured vehicles like tanks. Now, three companies are asked to put forward designs and even though I've not been able to pin this one down, I do believe that probably what that original requirement was, was for hulls only, and the Department of Tank Design are the ones that are coming up with the turrets, because the turret is going to be the same on each of these three different offerings um, from the private companies that are approached. Now those companies, Vauxhall comes up with a potential solution to this uh, requirement, they are going to do a smaller version of their Churchill tank that they're in the process of developing. Smaller, lighter version of that. Nuffield basically get there already what they're making as a cruiser, um, their Crusader tank as it was being called. They look at improving uh, the hull of that vehicle, strengthening the suspensions and using the Liberty engine again in the back. That's their suggestion that's put forward. And another company, the Birmingham Railway Carriage and Wagon Company, they are asked um, again to come forward with a, a new design. Their design looks very similar to the Nuffield, slightly different suspension and track system. So there's obviously um, collaboration with the Department of Tank Design because these three vehicles, when you actually look at what's being presented, are very, very similar in shape, in weight, and they've all going to have this same rather boxy turret that I think is probably actually um, developed by the Department of Tank Design. Uh, weaponry, by the way, for tanks in Britain, this was called free issue. In other words, the, uh, the guns were gifted by the war office to whatever company was making. So there's only bits that the company on a vehicle have to actually look after and control. January of 1941, the Department of Tank Design um, they've been helping with Nuffield. They recommend the A24 uh, is what is going to be the acceptable uh, vehicle. A24 is a one made by Nuffields and it's got the Liberty engine in the back. That's the one they decide they want to go for. Now, with hindsight, we might wonder why Nuffields was given this because as a, as a project, because Actually, we know that the Crusader tank had a terrible reputation quite quickly for unreliability, yet Nuffields was the ones they went to. Um, now, there is a bit of a reason. If you actually look at the date that that uh, contract was awarded, actually, at that moment in time, British tanks were doing rather well in North Africa against the Italians. Um, 
And even though there had already been complaints about uh, failures with Nuffield vehicles, unreliabilities, etc., um, at least they were already building tanks. And this is another one of these background issues, which is um, who can build tanks, who can make them, where is the capacity as the war's already begun. So maybe it's a bit more understandable that already Nuffield have been building vehicles, therefore we'll go back to them with an idea um, for this, what becomes the A24 tank. Now, what's that tank design like? It's um, based to a large part on existing Nuffield parts. And again, sensible ideas. Let's go for things we know about already are manufacturing. Um, it ends up looking very boxy. Um, it's got a square turret. It's got uh, about six inches taller than the previous Crusader tank there. Um, the turret, the design of the turret is such that there's actually a two skin system inside the turret is welded a box of relatively thin metal work. Outside, um, you've got about 76 millimeters of thick armor square plate done, I believe at the time, just for sheer simplicity, because they also know other companies are gonna probably have to be given work um, to get these tanks produced in enough number. And you don't want to be going for too sophisticated a system just yet. So that inner liner is welded, the outer, uh, armor plate has about two inch bolts, uh, diameter bolts that are actually holding on uh, the plate to the inner part. And those two inch bolts, they've got huge great nuts on the end. They're also tack welded in place so they don't fly off if the vehicles hit. And the inner, um, because this is homogenous armor, that inner box shape is actually there almost like a spool lining. And um, because with homogenous armor, they've already discovered in 1940, when it's hit by a higher velocity German gun, there is a tendency of it not so much cracking, but spalling and flaking happening on the inside. And if you can capture that, you're making the crew protected and safe that way. Um, what else about the vehicle? Um, they think they're gonna equip it with the uh, six pounder gun. Um, it's going to have an internal gun mantlet, and you can see that on the uh, Centaur we've got here. Actually, the mantlet's not on the outside, it's on the inside. Next to the six pounder would be the Beezer machine gun, 792 Beezer, and another Beezer will be put in the hull of the vehicle. That's the ideas on the early days. And uh, rumor has it, whether it's true or not, some of the crews were not over keen on the way of that internal mantlet because they basically seemed to think it gave a real aiming point as a dark square on the front of the tur turret sometimes. So there's pros and cons about doing it in that particular way. It's gonna have the Liberty engine and Nuffield have been working on the Liberty, trying to upgrade the power. At the end of that project, they get about a 400 and just over 400 horsepower out of a Liberty engine, which is pretty good, but it's still really, when you're thinking about it, it's based on a First World War engine that's uh, really coming to the end of its development phases. You know, you can't get much more out of that Liberty and the engine's going to be one of the major issues about the Centaur as it goes into production um, and a part of this bigger Cromwell picture. You've got a 14 inch manganese steel track, about 124 links on each side there. Um, later, they put a wider track on. Um, so it's a fairly simplistic looking vehicle but again, I repeat, you can understand to a degree why they want to get this into production relatively quickly. They need that more firepower, the six pounder gun out, and it's going to have that better frontal protection. The problem with this program, the A24 program that then becomes the A27 program, we'll see, is it takes too long. So by the time it comes into fruition, actually, there's, uh, these tanks are now being outgunned by the enemy and they seem to be a couple of years out of date. So another one of the points about this vehicle that will move away from the vehicle and look at another subject, but it's that issue of the engines. Now, Rolls-Royce are making the famous Merlin engine for Spitfires and Hurricanes. Their developmental team, headed by a chap called W.A. Robottom, he goes under the name Rumpty Robottom, great name, he has not got enough on his plate to do in terms of experimental work. And he's already talked to some people in the Department of Tank Design about their problem of finding enough power in an engine so that more armor protection can be put on British tanks, uh, faster speed and a more powerful gun. Because if you've got more horsepower, you can do that. But it's got to fit in a very confined space. So Robottom managed to get hold 
of some crashed Merlin engines. They were basically engines recovered from crashed planes in Britain. And he starts working on converting the Merlin into a suitable engine for the tank. And to do that, he takes off the supercharger. He does things like he changes the gear case. He's got to find a, a way of putting a drive belt on so it can uh, work cooling fans, etc. For all of that, he managed to get this done on these broken engines. And so he offers back to the war office a new engine that they're going to call the Meteor. And that has now got over 600 horsepower. And once the war office and the part Department of Tank Design see this engine, they test it in a Crusader tank. It has enormous potential. And that then affects the A24 tank program because straight away they're all looking, thinking, hang on, we can do something better now in terms of the engine power for this new tank we're developing. The problem is when the Department of Tank Design offer the Rolls-Royce engine up to Lord Nuffield and the Nuffield organization, Nuffield is adamant he wants to stick with the Liberty engine that he spent so much time in improving on and developing. Now, David Fletcher makes the point very interestingly, you know, why didn't the Department of Tank Design, the War Office, why didn't they challenge Nuffield to say, look, we want to go ahead with the Rolls-Royce, we're in charge. Doesn't happen. One of those classic moments where you can see British tank design development, um, some of that overall arching, how this is being run, is not um, Britain's finest moment at certain points in the war. And Nuffield goes ahead with his A24 project, um, still using the Liberty engine. Department of Tank Design, though, are very keen on this new Meteor engine from Rolls-Royce, so they start another project. And what we end up getting is basically, in the end, three different strands that uh, at the time are called the Cromwell Project, um, but they're actually very different vehicles. Now, they're not given these new names straight away, which makes this whole project even more uh, annoying, but we start knowing them. The A24, led by Nuffield, still with that uh, original Liberty engine, that is going to have a Wilson Episatic gearbox in it. That is going to ultimately be known as a vehicle called Cavalier. Now, the War Office wanting other options, they push for another version of the vehicle, um, which is going to be the A27. And because they haven't got the Rolls-Royce engines ready yet for the Meteor, they're going to call this an L model. And the A27L will have a Liberty engine in it, but it is designed to be able to take the Meteor later on when the Meteor engines become available and production's uh, uh, allowed because we can take the engines off the aircraft industry, convert them, or build them specifically now for tanks. But that won't be for a while, and of course the tank's going to be needed sooner. Hence the A27L, and that's what ends up being known as the Centaur. And the third option, which is the A27 brackets M, Meteor, that's going to be the what ultimately becomes a Cromwell tank that we all know and love um, with the Meteor engine in the back. So it's a complex story of those three vehicles. Um, and even worse is actually Leyland, who are put in charge of trying to get the Meteor into what becomes a Cromwell tank. They back out quite quickly because they can see they've already had the war office is particularly keen that that engine is kept cool. They've already had problems out in the desert with the cruiser tanks, Crusader, etc. Um, Leyland is worried about this and they hand the project over to English Electric. And it actually takes nine months to get the Meteor engine's cooling system worked out effectively. And yet again, this is impacting on these three different vehicle programs because what they end up doing is trying to work out if this vehicle is going to be converted later on into a Meteor engine, it's got to have the air intakes in the same place. So it's very confusing when you look at these three models that are similar in the first place, trying to work out which one's which. And of course, some of them start life as an A27L for the Liberty engine, but later in life are converted over to the Meteor engine. Um, so they become a Cromwell A27M. Complex story. So 1st of March, 1942, uh, the actually, even though it goes against the, uh, the plans of things, uh, the A27M is actually the first vehicle that's actually tested. Uh, Centaur comes along with a Liberty engine afterwards. Um, 
January 1943 production of the A27M starts, um, and that becomes the, as we all know now, the Cromwell tank. Now, to add to the confusion of this story, there's also, in parallel with this backing of a, a new engine, there's also questions then over firepower. Because as the project runs on, initially the idea of the six pounder, fantastic anti-tank gun, um, will go through about 56 millimeters of armor plate at about 2000 yards away. So that was a really effective gun. But the trouble was the cruiser tanks in the Western desert that are already out there, they start realizing that actually their theory of being the breakthrough tank, they might meet other tanks, hence the anti-tank gun, but they were also, Rommel is using tactics such as luring the British cruiser tanks to attack, um, but then onto an anti-tank gun line. And for firing at anti-tank guns, you really want high explosive because again, that has blast effect rather than firing this one solid shot, hopefully hitting the, uh, the gun screen, etc. So there's a realization that a dual purpose gun um, may be more useful for a certain percentage of the tanks. Um, they decide they're going to get a Vickers to build a new gun. That takes too long. It won't quite fit in the same turret size. So one of the issues that comes up is a new gun that's based on the six pounder, but it's actually bored out from 57 millimeters to 75 millimeters. And so it can use the same ammunition that's being supplied for the Sherman tanks. And that means its armor piercing ability goes down. It'll still go through about 50 millimeters of armor at 2000 yards, but it's now got this high explosive capacity that the British military think is going to be needed, especially when we go back into Europe after D-Day. So there's a decision made that of British tanks, 10% of them are going to carry a new gun, a howitzer, um, that's going to be 95 millimeter howitzer. Britain comes up with this, you get the 25 pounder breech, um, you add that to the 3.7 anti-aircraft gun barrel liner, sounds weird, cut it down, that becomes a 95 millimeter howitzer. It can fire a good high explosive shell, but it can also fire quite an effective heat. High explosive anti-tank, in other words, a Monroe effect, hollow charge round, that will go through over 10 centimeters of armor. So they decide, yep, how it's is going to be useful in about 10% of the vehicles. They then say as well, 30% of them are going to need a high velocity anti-tank gun. So the six pounder, or hopefully as it's coming along now, the 17 pounder as well. Um, but that's a smaller percentage than originally all these Cromwell tanks were going to originally have that uh, just the six pounder on. But 60% of the vehicles going to be built in the future with the aim was we want 60% of them to carry that dual purpose, uh, what becomes known as the quick firing 75 millimeter gun, that bored out six pounder. And so these change, um, obviously the production targets, the way that these vehicles are gonna be built. And that also has a knock on effect of things such as stowage inside the gunnery training, etc. So a number of issues, as you can see, are coming along and affecting this project and one of the biggest ones is because they are now going out to new manufacturers and finding new suppliers because this is a serious vehicle that we're going to be building in. Um, they were hoping in the thousands, they are going to need new suppliers to help do that. And another thing comes into play now, which again is a burden for the Cromwell program, which is the failure of a number of components um, from new suppliers and new manufacturers trying to put these vehicles together. And that in itself, um, you know, there's an example of a hundred sets of armor for a Centaurs are actually made. None of them meet specifications. So those hundred vehicles had a red triangle put on the side and they could only be used for training um, because the metalwork wasn't good enough. And these are things that have a knock on effect to the troops. Now I was rummaging around in the archive and I found there um, some really interesting reports. They took some Centaur tanks down to the ranges and they've actually got on that report 33 um, problems they were finding with the Centaur tanks that went down there. For example, this is just one of the 33. Number 20, ammunition containers for the six pounders. The rounds either do not fully go into the container or jam and are almost impossible to remove in many cases. 
The responsibility for inspecting this point does not seem to be covered. Um, the fault may be due to either incorrect metal support for the containers or in the container itself. This point is important and it's one of the things that comes out. There's not enough inspectors in the factories checking things are being built to the right standard. And when you've got a new company that's perhaps sometimes doing this for the first time, you can understand there's going to be faults. And there's a really interesting line after you read all these pages and all these faults um, that comes out, um, which is basically saying we know from experience that there is nothing more calculated to make a unit lose confidence in its equipment than the issue of vehicles in the state of the Centaur tanks, which we have received. So you've got things there going on, um, which again affects not only these Centaurs have got to be built to a good enough standard, many of those earlier ones weren't and had to go back to the factories for adjustments and uh, newer bits of kit. Whilst in the meantime, changes in the guns specified changes in the engine specified are we going to have to refit these with the new Rolls-Royce engine that, that's another one of the problems coming along there as an example of how poor some of these tanks were um, of 129 issued in April of 1943 95 had major defects on them and 23 vehicles out of that 129 ended up having major clutch failures um, so the military decide that we are going to call the Centaur as a stop gap, is the actual phrase used, a stop gap tank. We are hoping that with the new Cromwell, where some of these problems ironed out with that new meteor engine, that is what they are banking on. And the Centaur ends up becoming really a training vehicle and then gets moved on to other areas to the point even America knows about these problems Britain ha Britain's having with this overall Cromwell program and they offer more tanks. Uh, Britain, there is discussions in the war office, should we stop making these vehicles and go over and using our production facilities to making other things? Some of these factories have made railway engines. Uh, Americans suggest that might be more uh, useful. In the end, the war office does cut production. Centaurs is one of the tanks that they decide to cut down. There were going to be about 2,700. Um, they immediately cut that order to 2,000. Not that many are actually built in the end. Um, but they do decide to carry on making tanks. They think it's too fundamental an issue for the British military if we were to stop making tanks in Britain at that time, despite the offer of the Sherman and the, despite the fact that the Sherman from 43 and 44 is really the main tank Britain is using um, because the Americans can supply so many of them. Now, of these Centaurs, they start using them not just for training, but they start thinking, well, hang on, we can do some other things with them. So this idea that when I was saying 10% of Centaurs or 10% of the British tank force to have a 95 millimeter howitzer, that for many people is one of the vehicles that you may be more familiar with seeing an image of a Centaur tank with that 95 millimeter howitzer because they were used for the D-Day landings. Um, Montgomery has already seen the fact, he's very well aware of our tank production issues. He's seen the fact that we're building tanks that aren't going to be necessarily good enough to fight in the front line, but he thinks it would be a waste to not use that firepower on D-Day. So initially the idea was the centre tanks with 95 millimeter guns are going to be, um, about 80 of them are gonna be put on landing craft, engines taken out, they're gonna need a lot of firepower, so why not take the engines out, fill that space full of extra ammunition, taken on landing craft near the Normandy beaches and fire going ashore so it's fire support. They're just basically using them as almost like mobile gunnery. Now, Montgomery, once he looks at that plan, he says, well, hang on a second, you might as well at least land them. So there's a bit more fire support that can lead the troops inland. So the Royal Marines, they have to put the engines back in these vehicles and uh, drivers are got from other Royal Armoured Corps units. And they go ashore on D-Day uh, in two different regiments as part of the Royal Marines Armoured Support Unit. And they are those very distinctive looking vehicles where they've got white painted lines around the outside of the turrets. That's so that again, gunnery officers, other troops from outside the vehicle could radio in five degrees left, four degrees right, etc. So they could pick out targets um, for this fire support. Much to everyone's amazement, these tanks actually keep going because there's not much support for them, um, but they're still there fighting in Normandy at least a couple of weeks later, 10 miles inland, and there's some classic images 
vehicles like Hunter um, that appear. So the Centaur does have a role on the battlefield, but not as a gun tank. Some of the vehicles as well, they're converted into, they use them as, uh, they take basically the turret with 20 millimeter Polston cannons on. Those are actually put on top of Centaur hulls. Um, and later in the program as well, they end up getting a number of the original Centaurs, removing the turrets and putting dozer blades on the front with a little winch arrangement. Uh, about 250 of those are converted by MG Cars of Abingdon. Um, they unfortunately, there's delays in their production. They only get to Europe from about April 1945, but they do see some service with the 79th Armoured Division towards the end of the war. So these original Centaurs seem to be used in a number of different ways other than what they were originally intended for as a gun tank that was going to be that heavy cruiser. So after all that, let's talk about this particular tank. This tank behind me actually started life as a Centaur gun tank. It was converted into a dozer tank and it was then subsequently bought um, some years ago, restored as a gun tank. And that turret, when we have a closer look at it, you'll see there's battle damage on it or range damage where it's been fired at, where it sat on a firing range. Um, by these conversions, a lot of work has been done on this vehicle already. Things such as originally the hatches for the driver and the co-driver on Centaurs opened upwards. Um, this was thought to be too risky because if the gun was over the top, they couldn't open that way. Um, there is a way you can crawl from one side through into the other side to escape that way. But again, if the vehicle's on fire, you don't want to delay at all. So they actually have on uh, the second type of hulls, they end up doing a side hatch that spins open to the side and allowing the crewmen to escape um, from that side of it. The vehicle, again, as you look at it, um, this particular restoration job as well, it appeared in uh, Band of Brothers and recently um, it's gone through really a, a, a mechanical rebuild. Um, so the engine, it is that Liberty engine in the back. Um, the track's been sorted. It's slack track, as it was called. Um, so metal track, no top rollers on a Centaur. Um, the spacing of the wheels, those uh, six wheels either side with their Christie suspension. Um, they're not actually even all the way down. Um, a good day with a Liberty engine running well, you could probably get about 24 miles an hour out of this vehicle. Um, all in weight, bombed up about 28 tonnes. The standard British crew in there, five crew members uh, would be in the vehicle. That changed obviously for some of the other variants that were um, put into production. The turret, as I mentioned earlier, it's not actually square, it's hexagonal um, because there's angles on the rear of that turret, but the key bit on that front, about 75 millimetres of uh, armour plate there. Now, of all of those vehicles, so when they were built, they tend to call them Centaur 1, 2 and 3. Um, I won't confuse us again with all these different names, but once they decided um, that this model was going to be Centaur, the Centaur 1 tended to have just the six pounder gun on. Um, if they re-engineered them, um, so Centaur 3 becomes the, the 75 millimeter quick firing gun. Um, some of those uh, originally were fitted in the first place with six pounder, they were later converted. And if you have your Meteor, you become one of the Cromwell 3 or 10 series if it was originally a Centaur. Uh, I hope you're following all this, you can see how confusing it gets. A Centaur 4 has the 95 millimeter howitzer fitted for it. Um, and uh, again, we've seen how they, they were used by the Royal Marines. So the Centaur OP is an observation tank and they are taken to Europe for the D-Day landings. Quite a number are converted and what they do is they basically just put a dummy gun in the front. So inside the turret there's room for two separate radios and map cases and they're being used by the Royal Artillery keeping up with the main tanks. Um, it's the idea of a sheep in wolf's closing. It can't fire, can't do anything, but looks just as effective as a normal tank would be. Um, they do see service across Europe, as do some of these that were converted into ARVs or armoured recovery vehicles. Now, as a lifespan, the Centaur doesn't see much more service, but some, about 52, are actually gifted to the Greek army um, just after, in 1946, there's a civil war going on in Greece. Um, unfortunately, the Greek army don't have enough trained uh, drivers and crew members, so they're not actually used till a bit later. Um, but some versions of this stayed on in the British Army 
um, some of the armoured recovery variants, for example, some went to Korea and uh, stayed on a little bit longer into the 1950s. But we're very pleased now to have this as an example here at the Tank Museum. Uh, mechanically, it's been running now. It's part of the Bill Bannister collection that's stabled here. Um, it'll be going away at some point um, where then the rest of the vehicle will be brought up to the standard of the engine, etc. that's there at the moment. The interior is still pretty bare and basic, um, but we hope to see that back again. And we were very fortunate to be able to see this running just recently on the Saturday at our Tank Fest event. So another key piece, however complex, a key piece of that British armoured cruiser story from the Second World War.